major research interests include topics concerning air pollution, secondhand smoke, the health risks of cell phones, road crash injury, and climate change. He's worked closely with the International Agency for Research on Cancer concerning radiation hazards and has consulted for the World Health Organization throughout the Pacific. He's been on the writing team for of the second, third, and fourth assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and is currently taking a leading role in the fifth assessment report. Since 2009, he's been the edit an editor for the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Public Health. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Alistair Woodward. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me if I speak into the microphone and walk around a little bit? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for all coming to hear me talk. I'm competing with uh, the basketball, <laughs> the soccer, President Obama, and uh, the most stunning evening I've seen for a while. So um, I, I'm, I'm honored that you've chosen to come and listen to me talk, uh, somebody who's traveled a, a long distance here to this very beautiful corner of the United States, which I've never visited before. So it's been a great pleasure for me to be here uh, and have an opportunity to learn a little bit about this corner of, um, of the United States. Well, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself and where I come from. Um, uh, if you've been to New Zealand, could you put your hand up just so I've got a sense of... Oh, good. Okay. Uh, well, you'll be familiar with my first few slides, but I thought um, that those of you who have not been to New Zealand might be interested to learn a little bit about where I come from. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to this topic here. Um, now, I've got the question. I don't have the answer, unfortunately. <laughs> But I've got some ideas about what the answer might be. Um, it's a fascinating issue, and uh, I look forward to some discussion after I've finished my, uh, my presentation. Where do I point this? Okay, it's that one. All right. Whoops. Okay, well, New Zealand is a long way away. Um, you can see down the bottom there. This is New Zealand here, and this is it blown up to show you that the, there are these two islands, and the red dot is where I come from, a place called Auckland. Um, now, the fact that New Zealand is so far away uh, is um, shown in some rather interesting aspects of its history. To begin with, um, New Zealand was, has only been settled by humans for about a thousand years. So it was the last corner of the Pacific to be occupied as uh, the Polynesians spread out uh, through Polynesia and then back uh, to New Zealand. New Zealand was the last landmass to be settled. So we've got a very recent history um, as uh, uh, a place of human settlement. The other interesting aspect of New Zealand's isolation was that when the Maori, that's the indigenous people of New Zealand, arrived a thousand years ago, the islands were full of birds. Now, many of those birds have since become extinct, unfortunately, but some are still uh, in evidence, including this one. The kiwi, you're familiar with the kiwi, um, which is our national bird. Now, some very interesting and unusual features of the kiwi. Uh, it's got no wings, obviously, as you can see. Um, it's got a funny, shaggy sort of a pelt. Um, it's got a long beak, and you can't see it, but its nostrils are at the end of its beak. It's the only bird with its nostrils at the end of the beak rather than at the top. It's nocturnal, but it can hardly see. It gets around by smell and touch. And it's got these funny whiskers around its face that you can see here. Um, now, what kind of an animal does it remind you of? Yeah, it, it's, it's sort of like a hedgehog or a badger. or It's a burrowing um, animal. 
uh, nocturnal, uh, very keen sense of smell. Um, now, it's not accidental that it's rather like uh, a, a hedgehog or a, a badger, um, because uh, when the Māori arrived in New Zealand, there were no mammals. New Zealand's the only corner of the world, as far as I know, which has got no um, indigenous mammals. And so birds evolved to occupy all the niches, the ecological niches that mammals have occupied elsewhere. And the kiwi had no wings because there were no predators. There were no mammals, or no mammalian predators anyway. So New Zealand is a very long way away, and it's got a very interesting and slightly peculiar history, uh, and it's got a very distinctive landscape. Um, as those of you who have been there will know, it's a recent, in geological terms, it's a, it's a recent part of the globe with very marked volcanic activity, uh, over-steepened mountains, lots of erosion, but some very beautiful coastline as well, this is the beach that I ride past on my bicycle on my way to work every morning. And, and this is the city, Auckland, uh, which I come from, which is on two harbours, not one, but two harbours, uh, on a narrow isthmus. So, um, so that's a, a very quick introduction to New Zealand, uh, and I hope those of you who have not been will have an opportunity to visit at some stage. But um, to the topic for tonight's, uh, tonight's lecture, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a public health doctor, as you heard. Um, I'm an epidemiologist. I'm not a laboratory scientist. Uh, I work with communities. And uh, one of the very important and basic measures that we use when we're looking at communities is what we call the life expectancy. And so I thought I'd just quickly explain what that means. Uh, it means the average, as you can see, the average number of years that a person can expect to live. Uh, it, so it's an average, and it refers to a group, and it might be life expectancy at birth, which means the average years of life that somebody might expect to live from birth, or it might be life expectancy at age 50, or at life expectancy at age 70. And uh, it might be information that we obtain from observing a group, uh, and watching, collecting information. Of course, that means collecting information for a very long time until we know how many years each individual has experienced. Most of the time, when you hear life expectancy used, it's the second kind. Uh, it's an estimated life expectancy. So if you look on Google to find out what the life expectancy at birth of a child born in 2009 in the United States is, then you'll find it's about 78 years. Uh, now, obviously, we don't know what the experience in the future will be of a child born this year. Uh, so we're estimating it on the basis of the mortality rates that currently apply in the United States. Um, and we say, what if a child born this year experienced throughout their lives the mortality rates that currently apply for individuals at various ages. So that's where a lot of the information that I'm going to talk to you about comes from. Uh, it's a very convenient way of summarizing um, mortality in a population with a single figure. Um, and for that reason, it's very commonly used when we ask questions like, is the health of the population improving? By how much? How does the health of this population compare with another population? Now, it's only one side of the coin, you'll be thinking, uh, because, of course, the health of a population has to do not only with how long people live, but how well they live. Um, and I'm going to come to that question a bit later in my talk. Now, the, the, the long history of life expectancy of humans is fascinating. I think it's fascinating. Um, and what I've done here is to sketch what we know going as far back as possible about the life expectancy at birth, how long an individual could expect to live, um, as far back into prehistory as we can, uh, as we can go. Whoops. Sorry. Um, and, and, uh, it, 
the earliest information I can find is about 8,000 years ago. And it comes from a cave in North Africa, where Tunisia is now, where archaeologists found skeletons. And they were able to estimate the age at which these individuals died from markings on the bones. Very clever, very complicated, and very difficult, uh, but some people are very skilled at doing this. So 8,000 years ago, uh, we've got some idea about the average age at death of a population in this part of North Africa. This is a place called Maghreb. Now, if you go forward in time, um, there is information from a number of other communities. This is from Greece, uh, about 4,000 years ago. A fascinating study from China, looking at the at a particular dynasty, the Wang dynasty. Uh, and these were people who managed to get hold of volumes, genealogy, family histories, um, over the course of about 70 generations of this particular family. And from these volumes were able to estimate um, mortality, age at death, life expectancy. In New Zealand, uh, people have done similar cemetery studies to the one in North Africa that I described. Uh, estimating the life expectancy of Maori prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Now, you can see over this period of many thousands of years, uh, there was not a great deal of variation. Life expectancy at birth was of the order of 25 to 30. 25 to 30 years. Hard for us to imagine, isn't it, when I just said life expectancy in the United States is 78 years. So, two bits to the history, both of them very interesting. Firstly, that over a prolonged period of human settlement, it seems that life expectancy did not change greatly. Although we saw the arrival of agriculture, uh, we saw all sorts of other developments in human settlement, the beginning of urbanization. Um, we're right here into the um, Middle Ages and beyond in Europe. And then the second aspect of the history that's fascinating is what you see on the right-hand side of that graph, which is this sudden improvement in life expectancy that we've seen over the last 100 to 150 years. And the next slide I'm going to show you is concentrating on what happens, what happened on that right-hand side. So this is uh, estimates of the average across, across the globe. And you can see the line comes in from the left-hand side here at about 30. So we're talking about a, a life expectancy average of about 30. And that's at the beginning of the 19th century. And by the time we get to the beginnings of the 21st century, we're at the top right-hand corner with life expectancies worldwide averaging close to 70. So, within the space of 150 years, a doubling of life expectancy worldwide. Now, that's an enormous change and provokes, obviously, questions about why, uh, why did it happen, why has it changed so rapidly, where is it going? Now, this is the figure for average worldwide, all the information we've got with all its imperfections, trying to estimate what, the, what the, the, um, the general trend was worldwide. It's even more interesting, I think, if we look at the best performer. So the next slide I'm going to show you is not an average worldwide. Instead, it's taking the country with the best life expectancy year by year from the time that we first had reliable information which is sort of the 1830s, 1840s. And this slide is one that I'm going to show you three times in my talk. It's got so much of interest in it. Um, so here's the first exposure to it. So here we are. This is for women, but the figure is very similar for men. Life expectancy at birth up here, going from 50 up to 95. Uh, and this is the time period from 1840 up to 2040. 
So there's a projection included here. And each dot, or each shape, represents a year and a country, which in that year had the longest life expectancy, the lowest mortality. Now what strikes you about this graph? Yeah, it's this, isn't it? I can see people doing this. It, the, well, firstly, there's this remarkable improvement in the longest living population from 45 up to about 85. So that's a very big change. But Yes, you, you're, you're jumping ahead, and I'm going to come back to that point the second time I show the slide. Um, very observant. But for the, for the time being, the point that I wanted to get across is that there's been this big change, and it's been remarkably linear. So there's this improvement over time that has not shown any signs of leveling off. Um, so this is a, absolutely fascinating and intriguing. You know, after such a long history of human settlement, uh, life expectancy has accelerated and it's improving and it shows no signs of, um, of flattening off. What is going on? This, these are big changes. And so I thought I'd try and find a way of expressing to you the, the magnitude of, this cha of these changes. <clears throat> One way is to say that um, mortality rates, so that's the, the, um, the chance of an individual dying in a period of time, say a year, um, are now in the United States and New Zealand half what they were 50 years ago. Uh, so that's an enormous change. Um, another way I thought of trying to express it was, let's take a hazard that you'd be familiar with, like tobacco, um, and, and we can estimate what the difference would be in life expectancy if we were able, miraculously, overnight, to eliminate tobacco. Um, that would lead to an improvement of about one and a half to two years in life expectancy. Now, in New Zealand... Since 1980, over the last 30 years, life expectancy has actually risen by eight years. So that's four times the improvement that one would achieve by eliminating tobacco. So that's what I mean about these being very big changes. And another way of trying to communicate it, the same information, is to say that we are gaining life expectancy uh, by about two and a half years in a decade. Um, now, that's the same as imagining that when you wake up in the morning, you have an extra six hours of life ahead of you, on top of the 24. <laughs> and every day, there's another six hours. <laughs> now, I'm not sure whether that's a happy prospect or not. <laughs> but that's the magnitude of the change that we're, we're facing. So the questions are, why? 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 Why is this happening? <clears throat> and I'm going to start by giving you um, something, well, talking about um, something that is not the cause. Now, the genes are talked about and the genetics, uh, human genetics is a fascinating area. Um, genetics is not the explanation for what I've just talked to you about. Genetic variability is an important part of the explanation um, as to why, in a population, some people live longer than others. Individuals vary, don't they, constitutionally, and their genes are part of that variation. But genes can't explain the fact that, on average, life expectancy has more than doubled in less than a century because our genes have not changed or have changed very little in the space of a century, and yet population experience has changed so dramatically. So genetics is to do with susceptibility. We are talking about something that's population-wide and is occurring in a short period of time, and so it must have some other explanation. Well, what 
what, what might those explanations be? Um, there, there are some things that immediately spring to mind. And uh, the World Bank in 1993 released a report where it took these three topics and explored how they might have each contributed to the improvement in life expectancy. So I thought I'd use the same framework for you. Firstly, this idea that in general terms, people's standard of living has improved. Now, this is my second sh display of this slide, and this is where the point that you made is one that I wanted to come to. Uh, what are the countries that were top performers in mortality over the last 160 years? And you're quite right, and you said that um, they are typically from Europe, but there's one country not from Europe that appears on this list, and what is it? Well, it's true. It's true Australia. It's true Australia is up the top of the list. But you must understand that for us in New Zealand, talking about Australia is like Canadians talking about Americans. Um, you know, that I... Australia is on the list and it's at the top of the list, but only because it's alphabetically at the top of the list. <laughs> and they hardly deserve to be there at all because they only, they only show once. Whereas New Zealand had the, the, the longest-lived population in the world for 60 years, from 1880 to 1940. Um, and uh, no, nobody, to my knowledge, has really seriously explored why that is. And so that's one thing I'm interested in, in trying to investigate uh, why that might be. Now, um, the, the migrants, the European migrants to New Zealand, at the time, so we're talking now about the 1830s and 1840s, because that's when most of the European settlement of New Zealand occurred, um, were well aware that the health of the settler population was much better than the health of the population back in Britain, Scot England and Scotland, which is where most of them came from. And this is an immigration poster, and it says down the bottom, here and there, or... Immigration, a remedy. So this was a poster that was shown in England uh, and in Scotland and Ireland uh, as a way of encouraging um, people to, to, to immigrate. And you can see that the family on the right is in blooming good health compared with the poor wretches on the left. Now, why should um, a, a migrant population be healthier than the population of the home country? Well, the first reason, it's a very obvious reason, is that you've got to be healthy to be a migrant. Uh, particularly at a time when you had to travel halfway around the world in a leaky boat um, uh, to, to get to, the, to, to, to New Zealand. Um, now, that undoubtedly was a factor, that the people who got to New Zealand were on the whole healthier than the people who stayed behind. But that wasn't the full explanation, as you'll see from my next slide. This is a very interesting study that I found buried away in a library, uh, a book published in 1859, which compared mortality in amongst British soldiers stationed in various parts of the empire, as it was at that time. Um, and this is deaths per thousand. It was a period when there was relatively little conflict. So these deaths were not caused by uh, warfare. They were caused by disease and casual injury, um, as might affect anybody in the community. And you can see that there was this enormous variation in mortality amongst British soldiers, depending on where they were based. Um, and mortality in New Zealand was a third of that, uh, of British troops in Britain at the same time. Now, this wasn't a selection effect. Troops weren't selected to go to New Zealand on account of them being healthy. It was just selected on the basis of the regiment. So this and other bits of information suggests that it wasn't entirely a selection factor, that there must have been something in the New Zealand environment that uh, was particularly health-promoting. And I think you can see it in this poster, which I just showed you. 
See any features of life in the new settlement that might be particularly health promoting? Yeah, look at the food. The hams and hanging from the ceiling and the table groaning with food. But this photo comes from a history of the New Zealand diet. Um, an enormous cabbage. And then a, a quote down the bottom from one of the settler diaries where this woman said, We had come to a land without scarceness. We had no luxuries but abundance of wholesome food. And I suppose cabbage fits into that category. Although I must admit, if you read the diaries, what they were really impressed about was not the cabbages so much, uh, but the fresh meat, the fact that they could have mutton chops for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, now, is that part of the answer? I think it is, uh, as to why uh, New Zealand, the colonies generally, but New Zealand in particular, uh, was one of the first countries to show this improvement and rapid improvement in life expectancy. The effects were visible in other ways. Um, this uh, is a picture of New Zealand soldiers in the First World War. Now, all soldiers, when they went to the war, as they went to most, when they went to most wars, were examined and measured. And so there are records of the height of soldiers in the First World War. Um, and New Zealand soldiers were the tallest, along with South Africans. And uh, the average, the, the difference with the English soldiers was of the order of four to five inches on average. Um, now, why might that be? Uh, well, here is uh, one author's suggestion. Um, the remarkable height of colonial troops was related to the access to good farmland, uh, the fact that settler communities were relatively egalitarian in terms of the way that food and resources were shared out, they had access to a combination of old world and new world foods um, and the low population density that limited the spread of infectious disease. And I think all those factors were important in New Zealand and were part of the explanation as to why, uh, conceivably, as to why the, the health of New Zealanders was so good at this time. Now, I should note that I've only talked, I've talked about the health of New Zealanders, but in fact it was only some New Zealanders that prospered in the 19th century. Because we have a history of settlement and colonization rather like yours, I know, um, that there were, were indigenous people in New Zealand, and the Europeans arrived, and they were dispossessed. So this map shows Maori land in one of the islands of New Zealand, in 1860, you can see it was mostly um, occupied by Maori. And a hundred years later, where Maori lands had virtually vanished altogether. And the good health of Pākehā, or non-Maori New Zealanders, during the 19th century was balanced by um, very poor health of Maori, who had no access to, to or very little access to land and whose diet was very poor during this time. So there's some attractiveness in the idea that um, we can link life expectancy to a standard of living, and in particular to nutrition. But the connections are not absolutely straightforward or easy and predictable. One other aspect of uh, standard of living is income or wealth, and that, of course, is measured uh, using things like gross domestic product and, uh, uh, and income and dollar terms. Um, if you look closely, the relationship between wealth and health um, is not a very close one. And I, I've chosen this example. This is not New Zealand. This is from Korea to make this point. Um, Korea is a fascinating country also uh, because, of course, it's undergone a remarkable economic transformation in the last 30 years. Um, and in this slide here, um, the, uh, the red line, sorry those of you at the back can't see very clearly, this shows gross domestic product per, per, per person in South Korea uh, adjusted uh, for changes in spending 
uh, power over time, uh, from 1910, so from the beginning of the 20th century. And you can see there was very little change until the 1970s, and then this remarkable uh, increase in economic activity in Korea. The blue line shows the improvement in life expectancy in South Korea. Now, how well does the improvement in health match the improvement in wealth? Yeah, I mean, they, you might say in the, the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a correlation. Uh, but for much of the century, while South Korea was very poor, the country nevertheless experienced a considerable improvement in its health uh, and improvement in life expectancy. And this story can be told over and over again. That the two don't necessarily go together. Now, the second of those three categories that um, that I was uh, I mentioned to you, of course, was um, was med medical technologies. Uh, can we attribute the improvement in life expectancy to the wonders of medicine? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that we can. Well, the story is complicated. Let's say it's the story is complicated. Um, now this. This shows the decline in deaths from TB, which used to be the major cause of mortality in New Zealand and in the United States 120 years ago. Uh, and this is in England and Wales. And you can see that the blue line, which is the mortality rate, shows this continuous decline from way back in 1840 when uh, information was first, was first, uh, first available. <clears throat> now, when did medicine have something useful to offer? the treatment of tuberculosis. Yeah, after the Second World War. And that's where the second of these red arrows is. This is showing the introduction of chemotherapy uh, here in 1945. So <clears throat> there must have been something else to explain most of the reduction in mortality from TB apart from medicine because the reduction occurred before there was effective medicine. Now, that's not to say that medicine, effective medicine has been unimportant. Uh, it certainly has been important in terms of accelerating the improvement in mortality since the 1940s. Oops. And this is just another way of showing it. Those of you who've work with numbers would understand that logarithmic scales are the appropriate way to display changes um, in, in rates. And uh, this, this shows, makes the point that the decline, the long-term decline in mortality from TB accelerated considerably when chemotherapy was introduced. So modern medicine has certainly played a part, uh, but it's been a latecomer. What about modern health care? Um, well, in New Zealand, uh, we've looked at this question of how much um, health care is contributing to changes over the last 20 or 30 years. And we've done it by looking at the causes of death that you would... Um, death that you would expect not to have occurred given that health care is available. Pneumonia burst appendix, diabetes, those sorts of things, which are eminently treatable. How's, how has death from those causes changed over time compared with, uh, with all causes? And <clears throat> the, um, the answer is that the reduction in deaths due to, that are amenable to health care have probably made up about a third of the improvements overall in the last 20 years. So that's a significant fraction of the changes that we've seen in recent years. It's not the full story, but it's not trivial or insignificant by any means. Public health was third on my list. Um, and this, of course, is um, good old-fashioned sanitation and hygiene. Uh, lovely picture from a German textbook. Uh, 
um, which portrays vividly the hazards of uh, village life in Germany in the late 1800s. Oops. You can see the, the privy over here, the cesspit, the well from which the water is drawn, the surface runoff here. Um, and it's not too difficult to imagine how diseases like typhoid and cholera can have been so serious uh, and so common. So, of course, the improvement in sanitation uh, was a huge step forward in terms of um, overcoming diseases like these and contributing very importantly, to the reduction in mortality, particularly amongst children, uh, particularly amongst children, infants and children. And that was the major reason for the improvements in life expectancy early on, was this improvements in, uh, in the health of children and young people. But it's interesting that the uh, improvements in life expectancy over the last 20 years have been not principally due to improvements in child health, but improvements in the health of people like you and me, middle-aged and older uh, individuals. Um, and the next slide shows this. Now, this is, um, this is showing death rates uh, by age, by calendar year. And it goes back to 1860. This is for New Zealand. Um, and you can see the blue line is for infants, and it shows this decline from a very early period. The colored lines up here are for older adults in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and up here in the 90s. <clears throat> and you can see that for a period there was not much change. And then, very interestingly, in the last 20 years, in all these age groups, mortality rates have begun to fall, even amongst those in the oldest age groups. So we've seen this change in the nature of the improvement from phenomenon that was concentrated amongst children and young people to a phenomenon that's occurred and affected and benefited the whole population. Has modern public health played a part? Um, this is one of my favorite posters from a group called Doctors Ought to Care uh, back in the 1980s when cigarettes were still advertised. And this group decided that the appropriate response to the advertising of cigarettes was mockery. And so they uh, published posters of this kind. <laughs> and the answer is modern public health has played an important part in these improvements in the health, not just of ch children, which has been very important, but of older people, as a consequence of the, the um, decline in uh, heart disease due to things like blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking, which have all declined considerably in both your country and mine, and to a large extent as a consequence of public health activity. Just to give you a New Zealand example, um, New, Zealand, uh, <clears throat> New Zealand has a lot of grass and a lot of dairy cattle. It has a dairy board, uh, which has considerable political clout, and that may explain why up until 1975, you could only get margarine on prescription. <laughs> And then um, this, this cartoon is from a period when the, 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 um, the National Heart Foundation up here um, agitated because New Zealand had very high heart disease rates uh, and um, the Heart Foundation argued that one way of coping with this was to give people some option to use margarine instead of butter. Uh, and uh, th this, this says here down the bottom, don't eat butter says, sorry, says Heart Foundation, yeah, don't eat it, but says Heart Foundation. And the poor old farmer, dairy farmer, of course, 
uh, is so um, upset by this that he's uh, apoplectic. <clears throat> and his wife is racing across to say, quick, get some margarine. Because the Heart Foundation said New Zealanders who want to avoid a premature heart attack should stop eating butter. And the cows here are a little bit anxious. <clears throat> yeah, no, so it's true. Margarine was sold only on prescription and also it could only be marketed with food colouring added to it. Grey food colouring. <laughs> so I'm coming towards the end now um, and I guess the question is what do we have to look forward to? Where, where are we heading? Uh, and of course the straight line seems to just keep going up into the sky. It can't keep going up into the sky, but how far will it go before it reaches some kind of a, a, a plateau? Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, in New Zealand, we've taken a stab at what might be happening over the next 20 or 30 years, assuming that the uh, improvement is going to continue, although perhaps a little less steeply than it has in the past. We're perhaps talking about an extra four hours a day rather than an extra six hours a day. Uh, but that's the direction in which we're moving. Uh, and that has some quite significant implications, doesn't it, for the kind of society we're going to have in the future. And, of course, obviously for this question about um, is living longer, in fact, a good thing? Are we going to be living better as well as, as, as being around for longer? And I'm optimistic. I think that the uh, chances, that the trends are generally positive. Um, this, is, um, this is a cycling club that I belong to. Uh, and uh, here we are gathered around a fellow called Doug Bates, who's in the middle of the group there. Um, and uh, he decided that he was going to do um, the Round Taupo bike race, which is 100 miles quite steep mountains, um, and he is 81. So we uh, all decided to ride around with him, and, uh, and he did it, and he did it in a fine style. Now, 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 Doug is a rather extreme example, perhaps, but he's not unusual. In fact, what we are seeing is that 80-year-olds nowadays are much healthier than 80-year-olds were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, that at a given age, today's population is living better than people were in the past in terms of their fitness and their, um, their disability, and I must say their expectations. There's another member of the group, not here in this photograph, who's in his 70s, so he's a youngster compared with uh, Doug, um, and uh, he'd had a stent put in his coronary artery some time ago. Uh, he was finding it difficult keeping up with Doug on the hills. So he went back to his cardiologist and asked if the cardiologist would put in a bigger stent. <laughs> so um, in terms of where we're heading, um, I think it, on the whole it's positive. Although there are these two forces. One force is um, extending life and the second force is prolonging disability-free life. And sometimes those two forces don't work in synchrony. So it's a bit difficult to tell where we're heading. But I am inclined to be positive because not only are the trends heading in the right direction, but we know quite a bit about how to improve life and how to live longer better. There are some simple things that we can do that make a big difference. On this slide, um, probability of dying after 80 without disability, that's not a bad definition of living a good life, except I'd change it from 80 to 90, I think. So this idea that uh, a healthy life is one where we live to an advanced age and then just switch off um, without suffering any disability. And th you wouldn't be surprised, people who are well-educated, are more likely to live longer without disability. People who don't smoke are more likely. And physical activity, a really important factor 
makes a big difference to people's chances of living long and living well. We're facing in New Zealand uh, um, a new society, uh, and it's not quite the same in the United States, but you're heading in the same direction. Uh, the blue line shows the numbers of children. The red line shows the numbers of people 65 and over over the next 50 years. Um, there was a, an unfortunate newspaper headline that said, um, uh, number of elderly projected to explode. <laughs> Somebody wrote in, commenting on whether this had something to do with the New Zealand diet. <clears throat> but uh, we, we are, we are facing quite a different society over the next 30 or 40 years. And that's going to bring uh, lots of positives and lots of challenges. Um, and that's a topic in its own right, really. But the, this is my conclusion. I've come to the end. Um, and, and these are the points that seem to me the important ones. Uh, uh, I look forward to talking about them. Um, we've had this remarkable phenomenon of a decline in mortality and an improvement in life expectancy. It's been continuous. It's been sizable. And it's been resilient, point that I haven't talked much about. But, of course, there have been many things that have happened over the last 50 or 100 years. Uh, wars, depressions, epidemics. And yet, throughout, this trend has continued. Um, there are inequalities. I've talked too much about averages and not enough about variations and inequalities. Um, there are substantial inequalities. Uh, but um, I think they are amenable to reduction, and we've got some evidence of where things have improved considerably. What do we face looking ahead? Well, my judgment is that um, continuing improvements in longevity are very likely. Uh, there are limits. There have to be, but we don't know where exactly they lie. It's a little bit l more difficult to tell what we face in terms of health span not lifespan, but health span. Um, but as um, I've already said, uh, there, there are some very positive trends that uh, disability-free years, good li li years in good health have increased in the past and are projected to increase in the future, although the numbers of people at, w at advanced ages is going to increase and is going to increase substantially. And lastly, question, what can we do uh, to promote healthy aging? There's much we don't know in answer to that question, but there is a good deal that we do know. Uh, and uh, I've mentioned a number of the things uh, which are very strongly related to good health throughout the lifespan. So thank you very much for your patience and your attention, uh, and I look forward to your comments and questions.